Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana White. Today we are at the fifth talk of Creative Encounters by Dr. Dennis Slattery. And what a pleasure this whole five part series has been. They're all recorded. They are all online and available for viewing on the Mythology Channel and on Mythosophia. So John Booker is going to talk to you about the Joseph Campbell Book Club. So there you go. Take it away, John. Thank you, Dana. We are excited that the Joseph Campbell Foundation has partnered with Literati, who uh, has created a book subscription service um, that uh, has been very popular with children. They've now launched out into the adult book market. And Joseph Campbell Foundation has partnered with Literati to create the Joseph Campbell Myth and Meaning Book Club. And it is a subscription service that you can um, get a, a physical book every month and then engage in the Literati app to discuss the book uh, throughout the month uh, with other members of the book club. This next month, we are discussing the Book of Tea, uh, which was a book uh, from Joseph Campbell's Sarah Lawrence College reading list. Um, and then the, the, in the month of October, we're going to be discussing the Wayfinders from Wade Davis. So we would love it if you join the book club and engage the material. Again, it's books uh, related to mythology and with some sort of mythological connection, as well as books by Campbell himself that we'll be discussing each month. We would love to have you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Okay, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Dennis Slattery and let's get busy and let's hear about writing myth, reading individuation and the making of meaning. Great, Dana, thanks so much. And again, thank you panelists for staying with me for the duration. I, there's a part of me that can't believe that um, this is class uh, five uh, already. And uh, I'm kind of excited to present uh, what I have for today. It's um, notes that um, interrogate or explore the archetypal nature of reading. And I think I want to start, and I have not published uh, any of this. I have three sets of notes, and I chose one that I thought might be the best one for this evening. But I've not, uh, I brought it up in one of the epic classes at Pacifica a number of years ago, and I shared maybe 20 minutes worth with uh, the students that I had at that time. But I've never presented this material until tonight, and none of it has been published, and we'll see what happens. But I know that I'm <clears throat> talking to an audience of readers, which is why I thought I would end um, this class with the act and art of reading that part of me intuits contains all the major um, way stations of the hero's journey. Now, I haven't written that out, but I, it's something that I'd like to further explore. But, um, and thank you all, uh, participants, for staying with me, staying with us, and uh, to Dana and Will, who invited me in, oh gosh, uh, months ago. Now, this has been a real treat for me, uh, this kind of interaction. Uh, I want to start with a story, and I don't know if I was eight or nine or ten, but my introversion was really showing uh, at a young age, and um, I didn't particularly like going to school, <clears throat> so I developed a strategy 
um, at a time when uh, I had two brothers, and uh, still do, and then um, uh, later in uh, my life, a, a fourth brother came along, and then my sister. But at this time, uh, there were uh, two brothers, one older, uh, one younger than I. And I developed this strategy of um, waiting until my mother came up the stairs in the morning and I'd have a glass of water ready uh, to pour into the toilet and I would fake uh, heaving. And I got pretty good at it because uh, I was able to escape many days of schooling uh, through this strategy that I thought I was fooling her and of course, in retrospect, I realized she knew exactly what I was doing. But the joy of staying home, especially in the winter months, uh, we were very close to the shores of Lake Erie and we had these bitter northers come across from Canada. And that's when I would pull this off, not in nice weather. So she and I developed a ritual in which when I stayed home, she would go up to Roosevelt Library and this is in Euclid, Ohio, which uh, bumps up against the Cleveland uh, city uh, line. And she would get me five or six books, and she'd get herself books because she read all the time. It, my mother was an intellectual. I don't know if she ever knew that, but she loved ideas. And she loved that I loved to read. So she would go up and get books for me. and. <clears throat> Oh, things like the X Bar X Boys on the ranch. Uh, and I envy these young fellows for living on a ranch, I think in Wyoming. Uh, the Black Beauty series, um, uh, the Hardy Boys. And <clears throat> I would develop um, a tent in my bed with blankets, and somehow I propped them up so that I was in a tent like cave. I had a small plastic cream colored radio that I would pull in there with me <clears throat> and a couple of flashlights. And I would stay in there all day and listen to Nat King Cole, the McGuire sisters, Perry Cuomo, and read. And if I really behaved, uh, I could squeeze two days out of that. And then my mother would say, it's just really time <clears throat> for you to head back to school. Um, <clears throat> I didn't particularly like the Ursuline nuns. I had a couple of them that were really sweet women. <clears throat> uh, others that um, really redefined the word nasty. But somehow I survived the eight years of Catholic school, elementary school, and then went on to have the Marianist brothers and priests at a Catholic uh, high school. So my first 12 years of schooling was uh, Catholic and I don't regret it. But I certainly don't regret those times <clears throat> when I would hide out in my bedroom and my mother would be downstairs reading uh, and enjoying um, an escape, I think from reading, uh, raising three sons. And I think she got pleasure out of me upstairs, um, uh, not, uh, not being a nuisance, and uh, perfectly happy in my tent world uh, until about four in the afternoon when uh, my brothers came back from school. So I've always been interested in <clears throat> not only what I read, but why reading can be such a joyful thing for us human beings to do. It really wasn't until uh, Pacifica and um, finding it both challenging <clears throat> and satisfying to have students for seven hours where we would spend that time in one of the classics. And I became more and more interested as I read Campbell and as I read Jung, what is taking place psychically and viscerally when we enter a story that really wraps us in its movement. So what I'm going to present tonight is, um, it's not a rough cut 
but it's um, it's kind of bullet points or notes. And I will be very interested when we reach that point um, for some of your observations on your own reading life. And um, we're going to read a poem by Jane Hirschfield together entitled, Not Moving Even One Step. Because I thought it would be fun for all of us to uh, engage in the act of reading. And, and it's a short poem. And as I'll say to you shortly, I'm not interested in explicating it. Uh, that's not why I want us to read together. But I'm going to pose some questions to you about your experience as you read it, and then your experience as you reread it. And Dana has um, uh, created a really elegant um, backdrop for it so that we can all read it at the same time uh, on the screen. And then we can use that as a point of discussion. And perhaps you might uh, link some of the things that I'll say now to you, uh, to the reading of that poem, and to your own, um, your own style of reading. Um, whether you have ever created a ritual uh, preparation before you read, uh, as I do, uh, each morning before I begin reading. I, and uh, this is uh, 4.15, 4.30, uh, I light a candle, as I mentioned to you in the first class, I light a candle to Hestia, and that's my hearth fire in my study. And I have one small gooseneck lamp and the flame, and that's the only lighting in the study. And it creates that I think it creates that womb that I was creating when I was nine or 10 years old. And I find it um, really a satisfying way to nest, to nest into whatever it is that I'm going to read um, after I write in my uh, journal. So I'm interested in, in your um, mythology of reading because I think reading is mythic and it's poetic, and it's psychic. And I thought it would be a, a neat topic to play with here in class five. <clears throat> so I title this, Reading and the Nature of the Text in Depth Psychology. And um, <clears throat> part of this beginning, I have some notes that I've written out that I really want to include. and. <clears throat> I don't know how you work when you write, but so here's a page. See, it, it, the work's never completed. I had this typed up and really neat, and then I started to reread it, and I thought, you, need to, you really need to say this to them, and you ought to add this. And so this is what, this is what a, a, a work on reading in progress looks like for me, <clears throat> for me. and I'm, I don't think I'm uh, different in any way in that respect for you. So let me begin. I've posed the question to myself for years. How is it that a text, be it fictional or non-fictional, but I'm going to inflect towards the fictional, towards literature, towards poetry, how does it change over time uh, and over each rereading? I can't tell you how many times I've had students say to me, when we're reading the Odyssey or Moby Dick, especially. Uh, for many, reading Beloved, the, those are the three epics that uh, I would include, uh, was new for most of the students, but not the Odyssey and not Moby Dick. And on a break, they would say something to me like, you know, I read Melville's epic in high school. I read it again in college. And now it's been, 10 years, eight years since I've uh, read it twice. I didn't see any of this in those first two readings. 
And my intuition here is, I think our myth allows us to grow into works of literature. And I find them to be very elastic. They stretch out as we mature and deepen uh, to accommodate where we are at that particular mythic moment in our lives when we come back and read it again. But there's uh, some other reasons that I, I'm going to share with you, and they're purely speculative on my part, but they're based on the experiences that I've had in a lifetime of uh, reading. So I had assumed that it was that I had changed or the class members had changed from one group to another. Other books had intervened in the meantime to change the texture and the importance of that original text. If I'm remembering correctly, I think it was Julia Kristeva who gave us the term in literary criticism, oh gosh, 30 years ago? She called it intertextuality. And she said, it's astonishing what happens when you set texts up against one another, uh, not in opposition, but in complementarity. And they will start to cross over intertextually and share some common attributes or some common archetypes or some common behaviors. So now I'm beginning to think that a text or a poem, a story, a classic work of literature or nonfiction, like us, has a consciousness as well as an unconscious. And part of my fascination with the field, uh, the uh, archetypal field, the field of resonance, that is um, slowly constructed. I've noticed this in the classroom over a seven hour period, but also as we read and the, and the field of the work begins to uh, in womb us. And I think there is a transformative birthing that, has, that can happen, doesn't happen with every work, but I think the ones that have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, carry this energic, that's a Jungian word, energic energy, that when it begins uh, dialoguing with the energy that we are and have, <clears throat> the field uh, grows richer. And it's one of those experiences that you've all had, and you may have had it at a, uh, watching a film, but I, I bet you've had it reading that when you become engrossed in a work, um, time stops. And suddenly you realize you've been reading for an hour and a half. And it feels like maybe you've been reading for 10 minutes. That's a, that's a signal, in, in my estimation, that you're in the field. And the field is in you. And I think it's, the, it's one way that the imagination allows us to live in an alternative reality that has everything to do with the reality that we live in uh, on a daily basis. So this is something that I wrote out to add. So I, I may be a little clumsy in reading this. The field is both energic and symbolic. And see, to enter a symbolic field, I think is really to collapse space and time. And it can happen in other ways, of course, uh, in painting, in sculpting. But uh, I'm going to keep it uh, limited here to uh, literature and the poetry. <clears throat> I think what happens is that there is a union of both the conscious and the unconscious. And that union is consummated. And from this union emerges new situations, I think it can also include a transformation of attitude within us as reader. Uh, 
this is part of what Jung suggests about the individuation process. So I want to add here that I think that reading deeply um, is uh, very much a vital part of one's individuation process. And you know those works that you could name right now <clears throat> that truly transformed you in a way that may have had you shift the trajectory of your life or understood um, something that was uh, puzzling for decades. So there's, there, the individuation process, I think, is alive and well uh, in, the, in the act of reading. Thus, the work, I'm reading again from what I've added in writing, thus the work is a medium. It carries a mediating function. And uh, Henri Corbin speaks about that when he develops the idea of a mundus imaginalis, a way <clears throat> of entering an imaginal field. The text then is a mirror, as a medium, and it reflects back to us what we are willing to yield to, so to have it disclosed to us. Uh, it just seems so important to me what attitude we bring to the act of reading. And if it's already defensive, if you come to a work with a shield in front of you, uh, chances are it's not going to disclose much of itself to you. So there's a, there's a way of being, uh, and Campbell speaks of this so often in his works, of being open and yielding to what the work has to say, not what you have to say, at least initially. Uh, to the work, but I think a dialogue, uh, when it occurs, learning is taking place on a deep um, level and a very satisfying level as well. So then with each successive reading, a bit more of the text's unconscious is made available to consciousness, to its own consciousness, and to the consciousness of the reader. It may be a strange notion, but I think literary works are always self-reflecting. They reflect on themselves. And we as a reader are invited into that process, I think, of self-reflection, which is why I think text as mirror uh, is a rich image uh, to explore. What is in this collective unconscious is in part the myth that is shared and that powers the work. It's like an engine. It's a power source and it powers the work into, and now I'm going to steal a phrase from uh, Robert Armstrong's book, uh, I think I mentioned it a couple of classes back. Uh, the title, I think, will intrigue you. It's called the, Powers of, the Power of Presence, Consciousness, Myth, and Affecting Presence. And he's a humanistic anthropologist. He was, uh, and taught at the Uni University of Texas at Dallas, uh, just north of uh, the city of Dallas, for many years before he passed. So he, he coined the term, as far as I know, affective presence. It's when you feel a work viscerally that it becomes presence, present in a kind of embodied way and certainly in an energetic way. It can be that in a class discussion where many sets of ways of seeing are directed at the text, and that's why the, I think the classroom is such a marvelous place for all of these differences to have a resonant um, uh, presence with one another, that with all of these different ways of seeing, 
that the text then has less resistance to allowing its unconsciousness to be discovered. And I think it is a discovery. And it's exciting. Uh, it's exciting when uh, I would watch students come onto a theme connecting two epics, let's say. And the um, excitement in that discovery where they'll say something like, you know, I think I see something here between Homer and Melville or between Homer and Toni Morrison. I think I want to explore that for the final paper. But there's some real juice there because now the, now the reader has made these texts his or her own. Further, I think the text has a personal unconscious as well as a collective unconscious. And I say that because I think it taps something of the collective mythos of its time, of the period in which it was written in. But it goes deeper into the collective, into the unconscious of the collective, into the world soul. I remember reading a critic in graduate school by the name of W.K. Wimsett. And he wrote a fascinating uh, literary theory book called The Verbal Icon. And he coined the term, and those of you who were here for the um, uh, talk on Aristotle's poetics, he called it the concrete universal, which is largely what attracts us to these great works of literature. That they're at the same instant both um, concrete and particular, and universally uh, connected, what Jung would call the archetypal realm. Reading then becomes an archeological dig into the psyche of the text. Um, another flash from graduate school where I had the pleasure to take techniques of fiction class with Caroline Gordon, who with um, Flannery O'Connor, Catherine Ann Porter, Eudora Welty, was this cluster of genius women, uh, fiction writers. And Caroline Gordon was very instrumental in getting uh, Flannery O'Connor into print for the first time because she saw the genius uh, in her. But I remember one course with uh, Miss Caroline, as uh, we all called her. She said, keep this in mind when you read and judge a work of fiction, that at the same instant, it is reading and judging you. And then she had a little bit of a bite in her bent. And she said, and it may often find you wanting. In other words, there's a bit of inadequacy <laughs> in our stepping into the work, judging it, and being judged by it uh, simultaneously. So I've hung on to that for the last 40-some 40, 40 years, that a work is judging our capacity, um, and we grow into our own capacity and stretch it. Reading then becomes an archeological dig of the psyche, as I mentioned. So reading is both uncovering and discovering what lies below the floorboards of the text, what is not yet conscious. And I find and have found, and I bet you have, how powerfully a literary work can bring us out of areas of unconsciousness into a fuller consciousness. And not just of ourselves, but I think of the world. It may not become conscious until a culture or an individual is ready and ripe and willing. See, that willingness is so crucial to reading, being willing to be open to the text so it can disclose itself to us. 
And I think it knows. I think the text intelligence knows when we are open to it. And that's, for me, what happens in rereading, where suddenly there's a discovery of a structure or of a recurring archetypal image uh, or a motif that, lied, uh, that was hidden that suddenly pops to the surface. There are moments that are uh, joyful, I find. And I bet you do as well. So not until a culture or, or an individual is ready, ripe, and willing to be swept into the deeper eddies and swirls of the text and to see its deeper lineage and story from a more mature and, yes, even a more liberated, more inclusive, point of view. I find that these classics of literature are marvelous in helping us cultivate multiple points of view and not get stuck in one ideological fix. So the sensitive and probing reader can make it to that point wherein the conscious and unconscious nature of the text is held within one vision. So it's a balancing act. And I think it's a symbolic, uh, I think it's the, uh, it includes the cultivation of a symbolic consciousness, which is what we need in the world today in a massive way. Perhaps the receptive reader can plumb those depths of the work of which the author had no discernible or conscious intention. But there it is anyway. Which leads me to suggest to you that the author of a work may not be the most penetrating word as to its meaning. I'll never forget in undergraduate school when a good friend whose uh, recommendations of what to read I trusted absolutely. He said, you really need to read Thomas, Ma <clears throat> Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. So I went over to the Kent State uh, bookstore and I bought a hardback modern library uh, edition and began reading it. Uh, found it tough going, but I thought, no, stay with it. Uh, you can do this. One, one time as I uh, picked it up to continue to read, something told me to flip to the back of the book, and I did. There I found <clears throat> a letter uh, written by Thomas Mann to a graduate student uh, might, have been, might have been at Princeton, where Thomas Mann taught for a number of years when he fled uh, Nazi Germany before the Third Reich really took over. <clears throat> and Mann's letter thanked the graduate student for informing him, Thomas Mann, what the Magic Mountain was all about. I just found it a, a stupendous moment, an act of humility on the part of the author to thank a reader for helping him understand what he wrote. It was just a, a, quite a moment. Rereading, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be jumping just a little bit back and forth, but I think there's a, a, a decent a size thread here to pull the whole thing or keep it uh, on, a, on a track. So I find that rereading is a form of imaginal repetition and play that opens the work further to greater and deeper scrutiny. And it opens us, uh, remembering Caroline Gordon's uh, admonition, to greater and deeper scrutiny. Yeah, I just think that reading these classics are wonderful, reflective moments, and um, not unlike a therapy. 
In fact, I think they're very therapeutic and can be very healing. And they can also be dismantling. These works can dismantle us in ways where we're perhaps stuck. In the process, though, our feelings are reordered, even transformed. And as I just mentioned, some deep healing becomes part of the process. You know, um, uh, the name Jonathan Shea, who's a psychiatrist, who wrote Achilles in Vietnam, and um, mm, a work on Homer's Odyssey. I'll think of the title in a moment. And Jonathan Shea, uh, who still is uh, active as a psychiatrist in Washington, D.C., has for the last 35 years used Odysseus in America and Achilles in Vietnam. Those are the two titles. He uses these classics with Vietnam vets, even today, and with vets from Afghanistan to help them heal. And a uh, part, not a partner, but um, one who is also doing that work, uh, a man that I have gotten to know uh, quite well, Edward Tick, who would take uh, uh, Vietnamese, uh, American vets from the Vietnam War to Vietnam each November. And he did that up until last year where his health didn't allow him the um, stamina to do that. But he has used uh, these classics as well to help heal war wounds. So, and Homer understood that well, especially in some of the scenes that uh, are in the first books of the uh, Iliad. Uh, but anyhow, uh, not that it's incidental, but uh, it's not where I want to uh, pause. What the work allows, and these are all reflections of mine when I think about reading and how they have how, how these classics over the decades have helped me. What the work allows for is a more inclusive disclosure as one moves down and in and then back out, not unlike the hero's journey, to bring with one the lineaments of that reading, there's the boon that's returned with the reader journeyer um, on this pilgrimage uh, to share with others. Another image, I think the literary work is also a vineyard and I think it's also a cave. And so in reading, we do a, a, a vertical spelunk spelunking down and in. One allows the energies of gravity to pull one vertically into its recesses. So reading is both horizontal and vertical at the same time. It moves along the social sphere of the plot as well as drops down into the spiritual, political, and psychological unconscious that the work affords and helps us to shape and organize our own narrative. I think that as readers, we are all in search of the grail. And the grail for me is the work's form, its formative principle. And when we brush up against it or tap it, we know it. We know that that's, that's where the gold is. That's where the grail exists. When we tap its form, which is also to connect in some deeper way with the formative principles that guide us in our daily lives. The work says more, as we often do, than we know or that we fully mean. 
what is more deeply meant is hidden, below. It's invisible, but it pulses with the arcane energy of the works vision. See, all of these works have a vision that I think goes beyond its author. But the author is the catalyst uh, for what that vision becomes over time. You know, when, when uh, Moby Dick was published in 1851, critics crucified Melville and said this is a, a ragtag piece of disconnected uh, forays into fantasy and it has no shape. And, and uh, that was 1851. Really not until the first decade or decade and a half of the 20th century did a few literary critics trip back across that white whale and ask themselves, what the heck is this? And where has this been? I like to think of that as the culture needing to ripen and mature sufficiently to embrace a work that was written way ahead of its time. And so it took about 70 years for it to be not, not rediscovered uh, because it hadn't been, but to be discovered for the first time. And that work is not the only one that has suffered that um, neglect until the culture's psyche had ripened uh, into uh, being open to it. So I also want to add in this um, run through of reading that the libidinal level in the reader is transformed energetically into the symbolic. And that's the elevator down into greater floors that go deeper even than the basement and the parking garage of our unconscious. We study as we read, and this is, a, this is a term that when I tripped across it for the first time, I was just elated. This is from the uh, French philosopher and theologian Jacques Maritain, who among his writings wrote a uh, classic work off of the Yale lectures that he gave in the early 50s. And I can't, en I can't encourage you to look at this work uh, enough. It's called Creative Intuition in Art and Poetry. And it's a magnificent explication of the term that I'm going to use now that's his, the spiritual unconscious. And he says every one of these works, and works of art, not just of literature, has a spiritual unconscious, as do we. And when we reach that level of where that resides, um, reading then becomes a spiritual experience and perhaps a spiritual transformation. So Maritain says, we study the spiritual unconscious of the work when we reread, when we reconsider, when we revise perhaps our interpretation of an earlier reading, and when we recover what had not been fully grasped before. So I think we read into insights in increments. It just takes time and is one willing to put the work in, in order for these treasures uh, to be exposed and then to be integrated. One of the most effective ways to the above is through conversation, not argument. Meditation, not analysis. Reflection, not mastery. And to enter these works in a spirit of unknowing, a spirit of openness, not egoic distancing, 
wherein the work is treated as an object to be figured out or to be explained away or to be solved rather than as a mysterious organic being like a person to befriend, to acknowledge, and finally to respect. And to mention Boober's I-Thou relationship at this instant, <clears throat> I don't think is a stretch. Because if we read within the I-It uh, duality, uh, there's a really strong chance that the work will never touch us where we live. And so shifting to that relationship of mutual respect changes the entire cosmos in which we read. With each subsequent approach to the work, the text's energies, not ours, well, probably ours as well, but I was thinking of how maybe the text's energies are realigned, but for that reading only, you come to it again, or you come back to passages to read, and I think a different, maybe it's subtle, or maybe it's a subtle difference, but a different realignment is given the occasion uh, to happen. Um, let me just peek, yeah. The power of reading, then, is in the text's ability to sweep one along to its deeper caverns, and by analogy, it taps into the deeper caverns of us, the reader. And there, I think, resides a spiritual action, and not exclusively, uh, and none of what I'm saying here is to be understood as exclusive. But I would also point you to the first 20 pages of James Hillman's Magnificence, one of my favorite works of everything that he uh, published, the work entitled Healing Fiction, where he speaks about plot as mythos. And then another work that I will say a few things about in just a couple of minutes, and I pulled it off the shelf, this is by Matei Kalinescu, and it's entitled simply Rereading. And I'm still making my way through it, but he, his understanding of what takes place in rereading, I have integrated into um, where I'm headed here. But I want you to know about it because it's a, it's a magnificent meditation on the power of rereading. Conversation then, <clears throat> and I touched on it a minute ago, coaxes the text out of hiding to reveal more than it knows of itself. As we, here's the analogy, often reveal more than we know of ourselves when we speak. So I think conversation is in many ways akin to conversion. To converse is to invite some level of conversion of how we think about something or our feelings uh, or our understanding of our own histories. When we allow the text to speak and to speak deeply and let it speak whimsically let it speak unpredictably in all its forms. Our task as readers, as I'm understanding it, is to give it a shape or a coherent form that is communicable, that's coherent, that's cohesive, and that is constantly continuous. I think it's open-ended. I think any reading we do of a text or rereading of a text, it's always open-ended. It's as it, it remains as incomplete as we are. And I think that's where one of our strong compatibilities with these uh, classics of literature 
And by that I mean works that are being uh, written and uh, published today. I would put Beloved in that category of classics, and you could name others. Why don't I pause there for just a minute and see um, what observations maybe the panel might make, and perhaps we could get a participant or two uh, before I continue. Um, yeah, I feel it's it's time for a, just a little bit of feedback. Well, Dana, just starting, or sorry, uh, Dennis, just starting with a, a, a really basic, quick little thing. I thought it might be worth bringing up Heraclitus' quote, you know, a person doesn't step in the same river twice. And that's, you know, how yeah. you make, you know, a person doesn't read the same line in a book twice. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. It's always... I think, Will, uh, it's a wonderful analogy. And because we're in history, we can't read it twice. Because the second time we read it, time has passed and history's happened. And there we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dennis, I, I have thought a lot about uh, different times when I've let a long period go between rereadings <laughs> of certain books. And I'm amazed at how often when I will read something after, you know, 10 years, 15 years, even though I remember the basic uh, story or plot or ideas, it's, it feels like I'm reading it for the first time. And I don't know all the neurobiology behind how that works, but, um, you know, we have this mutual interest in wonder. And I'm amazed at how wonder can reappear in our lives even after you know 10 years have passed and i think i know that material i know that story but somehow that rereading invokes a new sense of wonder and uh, yeah. i wonder if you have that same experience yes john and i would uh not go one step further but just uh add to that i find that happens when i read something after 10 years that I've written. And I am, that wonder gathers around it. And I think, who wrote this? I had it happened in giving a writing retreat at Pacifica years ago when uh, the folks had written for 20 minutes on a particular meditation. And then we came, we came back together in the circle in uh, one of the rooms in Ladera. And uh, one woman uh, said, I didn't, re I didn't write this, but I, I just thought it was appropriate. And she read, she read two or three sentences. And um, then she paused. And then um, she said, do you know who wrote that? Not a clue. She said, you did in The Wounded Body. I mean, I thought, and then I had to say, hell, that's pretty damn good. But I did not recognize either my voice, my writing voice, or the content. So I'm right with you that as we get away from the word, that's why it's so great for when folks write to put it into a drawer, metaphorically, I'm not now with the computer, put it in a folder and leave it alone for a week and try not even to think about it and then come back with those eyes that have cooled down and reread it. And my gosh, how you can be your, your own best critic in cleaning it up or amplifying or, so I'm, I'm completely with you and it's, um, it's, it's magical. Uh, to come back to a work that you haven't written, but I find it fascinating to come back to something that one has written and think, you know, there is some some decent insights there that I haven't thought about since I wrote it. Yeah. I would like, love to jump on that for a second because Please. it brings up a couple things. Um, uh, at one point, you you you, uh, you said, uh, hi, by the way. <laughs> I want to hi, say Gara. And uh, I really want to give a shout out to all your neighbors in Texas and what's going on tonight and hope everybody stays safe. It's uh, really, really terrifying. But It is. It's terrifying. Thank you for yeah. that. 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, I looked you up on the map to make sure you weren't in the path. I was worried about you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I don't think we're going to get any rain out of it, but it's going to come up close enough to Austin that it's just up the street. Yeah. Yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, it, when you were speaking tonight, you, you made a comment that the author is the catalyst. And I just want to uh, bring in something to add to that, because I have found in my own work, and jumping on what you were just talking about also about something you wrote that, that uh, you know, uh, you don't even quite recall or whatever, but uh, because I, I often think of the author as the conduit that, um, yes. that uh, you know, because uh, as someone who teaches writing, the ability to allow this to, to flow through you uh, yes. often does mean um, that uh, you are bringing something in, you are the conduit that is bringing this into the world to be received in, in whatever, uh, how, however people need want or need to take it you know yeah. um and the ability yeah. to so, sort of just slide over and allow this to enter is, is quite is quite powerful so yes. so your your reaction because i i've had that to my own my own writing where yeah. i go i says wow, wow i wrote that <laughs> <laughs> right it's been a wonderful surprise. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, uh, but it, I, uh, another thing I wanted to comment on is, um, it, as someone who teaches writing, it is really interesting to have a conversation tonight about reading, <laughs> um, uh, because uh, obviously that's that's very very significant, and uh, you know so many of the things that you were talking about in terms of reading are also aspects of the creative uh, side of things. Um, yes. uh, that uh, one of the most powerful things that uh, that I, uh, you know, so many, so much that we, we learned at Pacifica, but one of the things that really jumped out at me was the the concept of the borderland, of that, yes. that, that very thin, thin slice between, no. between what we know and what we're coming to know. And I yeah. believe that's right. That's where creativity <laughs> takes place. That that yes. that 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 little teeny slip in there, yeah. and um, I think that uh, readers on the receiving end also are in in that little borderland slip where where uh, the thing also <laughs> comes, and that you know we can't take we can't get to it until until we're ready. I mean, yes. and I think that's that's the the power of narrative itself and of storytelling that yes. it, it speaks to us on so many levels uh, at different times and in and in different ways and um it uh you know my my whole bias is that uh, st a story is the human instruction manual that it teaches us how to live and that as as we as as civilizations and as cultures and as individuals individuate we're going to receive this material in, excuse me, in different ways, and um, and and that that's how we are touched. But uh, I really appreciate the conversation tonight. You, you again, I have pages of notes here, uh, just of um, uh, it's it's always nice to be able to to sort of look at something from another position, and and. Yes. Um, uh, I do have one other question, though. I, I was just curious about this. Several years ago, I had to real. I, I read for a living, and uh, it was getting so. I'm getting so much eye strain that whenever possible, I listen and instead of read, <laughs> yeah. I, I just I can't. Uh, you know, um, and so I've I've taken to to listening to a, a lot of books and stuff, and. Um, so you know you keep using the word reading and i'm wonder i'm curious if you would <laughs> include listening as reading because uh for me um it, it's the only way that i can consume a lot of this material now a and and i find it just as powerful in fact for how my brain works i think it's even more powerful yeah you bring up something really important i think you remind me you know when we lived out in Goleta, each summer I would drive back to San Antonio uh, to visit our sons and at that time our one granddaughter. And I remember uh, one summer 
one spring quarter, one of my um, myth students gave me um, the CDs of the entirety of Moby Dick, which I then listened to on the road, uh, driving the um, 1,600 miles from Santa Barbara to San Antonio. And it was a mesmerizing experience. And the reader was first rate and had individual voices for each of the characters. You know, Dara, I think it's different, but no less powerful than reading on the page. And I'm going to think more about it, but I remember that experience. And then uh, one summer, um, I listened to Toni Morrison, who was a fabulous reader of her own works, read Beloved. And those two experiences on audio um, sustained. I mean, I can't remember if Moby Dick was like 24 hours or 25 hours. Uh, it felt like 25 minutes. You know, for me, it makes even a more right-brained experience. Talk about slipping into to that, that zone of timelessness. I, I find that happening yes. much more easily an audio. But again, I think each of us takes things in differently, and, and that, that just yes. the way my brain works. Well, <clears throat> my wife has uh, survived two strokes over the last 11 years, and her and her reading is good, but it tires her. So she is um, uh, uh, one of the most faithful members of uh, Audible, <laughs> and she is listening to a novel. She told me that uh, this morning, that last night, I don't know, we went to bed at eight or something, and she stayed up till 1.15 listening to a new Stephen King uh, novel. And she loves the Stephen King world. And she said, I could, I put my timer on the, on the phone for 30 minutes, and then I would, 30 minutes would go by, and then I'd say, oh, 30 more minutes. And so she woke up this morning practically crawling around the house because the, the story had pulled her into a way she couldn't stop listening. Yeah, been there, done that, I know. No. Anyway, I, I just want to oh, throw that Great, out. great, They're wonderful uh, observations. Any any others? Um, yes, Dennis. Um, yeah, please. You know, what, you're, what you're bringing up is the way in which technology evolves to shape not only the substance and content of what we're coming in contact with, but the yes. fact that some of these can be a shared experience. When yes. Michelle and I go somewhere, we invariably get a book on tape and, and it just becomes something that unlike reading, which is in, in, incessantly private, um, there's just no way around it. Right. It's a beautiful experience to have someone else in the car and be able to, to listen to this. Now, we don't typically do it at home, although we did. Um, uh, we listened to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Oh. <laughs> and I mean, it was a fabulous experience. And we got oh. home and there were two CDs left. Do you know, we didn't even unpack. We brought the things into the <laughs> living room and we sat yeah. there and it was late. And we finally said, you know, we got to go to bed. This is this yeah, crazy. Funny. But um, beautiful. I do see some people in. Hey. Uh, Kwame, did you want to say anything? Or are you okay? Like there, I got I got a few pages of notes. Just quickly for me, wow, what what resonated with me primarily was, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, when we read, the reading reads us. Okay, so I really like that, and it's like because it's like the when we do a myth, the myth does us. And then you yes. talk about, about about rereading. There's a quote that says, if a book is not worth reading twice, it's not worth reading once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Answer, uh, Thomas Lyon <laughs> asked for the, for the author of that rereading, the rereading book. So just make sure you mention that or put it in the, in the chat, please. All right. Thanks, Dana. Yes. Yes. All Thank right. you for that. Let's, let's see who we have. <laughs> How about Tom Lyon? How are you doing up there, Tom? We don't have any more red suns, so it's not the Martian look anymore. But uh, for our firefighters, I sure. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Hi, Tom. Hi. 
good to see you. I, I was I, I was thinking that when <clears throat> when I read a book, there's always this part of me that is like I'm I you know I'm looking for something and I don't even know what it is that I'm looking for. <laughs> but when I find it, it you know it takes off. And so every book is like a new exploration. And I think that's this this part of reading that um because it reminds me of Jung when he was in his later years, he said, I'm not finished. I, you know, there's still so much and I haven't arrived there. And it's like this, um, I, like you said, in healing fiction with, uh, with Hillman, he talks about, um, it's almost as if we start a read with a feeling of inferiority because hmm. we haven't, there's still something of us that still needs to be developed. Yes. So I want yeah. to. That's no, that's a wonderful insight. Wonderful insight. Um, Hi, Sheila. Hi, Den uh, Dennis. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper <laughs> called The, Ver the Prenate is Verbal Relic, Springboarding Off of Your Idea of Scars as Imprints and uh, from the Wounded Body. Yes. And uh, this is um, something that I think you, you might want to consider or at least uh, come, come at, through this approach. Yeah. Um, you mentioned so many things that were natalistic again, uh, nesting and wombing, your mother's being uh, in cahoots with you. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to suggest that you learned this uh, love of reading uh, inside of her, whatever her chemistry was of, of uh, enjoying how she was reading or enjoying what she was reading. And maybe even you were trying to understand what she was reading through some sort of mentation, even though yes. that's a far, so uh, no, Hannah Strack, a, a feminist theologian, uh, writes the basic spiritual experience of the unborn child. And she quotes a psychologist mm -hmm who uses the term voice of God, and I'm quoting, just as in church ritual and prayer, one turns to a mighty God who is who both distant and near, a God by whom one feels accepted, held, and safe. So the fetus feels itself to be lifted and held safe by the powerful person in which it is contained, a person whose voice sounds far off as if coming from another world yeah. and yet so near. The fact that this person commands language makes her powerful. The fact that she speaks from a place which is beyond the uterine milieu makes her mythical and transcendent mm -hmm. and allows her to appear to be equipped with magical and omnipotent powers. The voice opens inner spaces mm -hmm. in the fetus in which it experiences a new power as a result of a resonation with the vocal movement of the mother, the power of emotions. Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. And Sheila, can I ask you, um, it, what isn't the, help me out here. Um, wasn't it the Mozart effect, the title of a book yeah. that spoke about the value of let's say classical music um, played uh, to the fetus and its effect yeah. on it. Yes. Um, yes, because the Mozart uh, mi rhythm uh, mimics the heart rhythm. Okay, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And the, the other thing, Dennis, too, is uh, <clears throat> Christopher Beige has written a book called The Living Cra Classroom, Teaching and Collective Consciousness, which you touched on a little bit about the field effect. The living classroom. Yeah, the living classroom. Chris Great. Bates. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can, will. I've been wanting to ask you uh, about uh, your, your thoughts about something. You know, we talked about, uh, Dara brought up the idea of the, the writer as a conduit. And, um, you know, one thing I'm really interested in is, is when Socrates says, you know, the, the artists or the writers, the poets, they're channeling something that they may not actually fully understand. And, and you've been kind of yes. talking around that, you know? 
And, um, and I love the idea that Socrates contemplated whether or not he should try his hand at poetry just before he died, you know? And then he was like, well, I should leave that to the poets. But uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is this idea of uh, the unconscious in your writing. And I wonder, you know, if one of the ways, not to be reductive, but one of the ways, you know, I tend to see the unconscious is as uh, unrealized potential or unengaged potential. It's, it's sitting there, but maybe not brought into consciousness, right? And so, you know, when I write something, I normally write an analogy that I know of, like a, a, I, I know the correlation that I mean for in my double speak. But the second yes. I create an analogy, I create infinite potential for additional projections into that analogy. And I, and, you know, yes. I, I just wanted to bring in and hear your thoughts about how this might relate to what you've talked about before, about how the imagination is spiralic. And every time we reread, every time we return to the same analogy with a new amplification, with a new perspective, it seems as though we might be cutting deeper into the spiral. Absolutely. It, it's, a, it's a drilling down. I mean, the way that a drill works is that spiraling, penetrating, uh, not in a, um, but, but not in an invasive way, but in an invitational way way. And you remind me of what I think the bumper sticker ought to be to replace um, Follow Your Bliss. And that is from Thou Art That. Metaphor is the native tongue of myth. So, Will, I mean, to create, to enter the analogical cosmos is to enter the mythical cosmos. Yeah. And I I trust Campbell on that notion, which is why art is so mythical in painting or in, in creating a, a, a day in one's life can be a mythical, creative um, achievement. And, uh, and, and so absolutely. And you know, in the, in the, in the, in the dialogue you're describing, where you know now the reader is in co-creation with the writer because if absolutely it wasn't the reader, you would have never had the other million analogies that could be made from that piece that was written they were just waiting there in the unconscious of the text to be realized and brought into existence i think it was the will you help me here but i think it was the greeks who fundamentally invented the classroom right i mean the the place of conversation and conversion and the um I mean, I can't tell you whether they did or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't tell you how in the 26 years I've been at Pacifica, how much I've learned from my students. I mean, my gosh, it's like I'm a student there, too. So because there's a field created in the classroom and it's not that everybody has to agree with one another, but there's a there's a sense of a consensus that allows each to listen and riff off of or extend what they just heard or a passage just read or this passage reminds me of something that took place three chapters earlier. Okay, let's go there and let's, let's look at that. So this, this analogical web that gets created, I think, is the is the stuff of uh, deeper learning. You know, since yeah. you're students, uh, you've also, I got a poem from a student today that she, or a couple days ago, a poem that was, she said was inspired by the class, the, some stuff I was talking about. And it was so nice. interesting because she has no idea how much she was writing in a way that was relating to my unconscious and the analogies I was making beneath the surface of the material I was putting forward. And then there's this crazy co-creation she doesn't even mean to be projecting back my projection in a way that triggers and activates even more of my <laughs> projection. It's unbelievable. And in that act, you realize, wow, reading, th this is a creative act. This is as creative as what Adam and Eve did as, as creation itself. Real creation is happening because it's happening on levels beyond the simple hammering of, of nails and the putting down of bricks, that all the powers of creation are coming in to these. Yes, things. beautiful. If, if, the, if the classroom is nothing more than data processing, 
uh, there's a good chance there's no real learning taking place. I mean, learning in depth is what, I mean, that's, that's where we are in these conversations. And yep. we're going to keep that in mind is we all shift towards online education, which is really good at teaching the data. And teaching the data, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let me, let me, uh, I mean, there, and there's more to say, and I'm not meaning to cut uh, anybody off, and there'll be another chance here. But let me go a little further, and then I want to get to Jane Hirschfield's uh, poem uh, for us to play with uh, for the latter part of the uh, of the class here. So some of some of what I will say now to lead us up to uh, Dana <clears throat> showing us the um, the uh, poem by Jane Hirschfield um, is part of my being influenced by my mentor of. 40 some years, Louise Cowan, who in 1972 accepted me into this new Institute of Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas in Irving, Texas, where she had engineered a program of six disciplines. And we were all required as PhD students to minor in a discipline, unheard of, because she wanted to not allow us to get fixed in one discipline uh, without exposure and engagement with uh, another. So uh, I majored, if you, were, if you will, in literary classics and theory and minored in phenomenology and one of the new faculty brought in uh, from Duquesne was Robert Romanishan. And so he was my teacher for two and a half years in that program and, and really is the one that got me an invitation to teach on a Saturday uh, to the MA counseling students that eventuated in the offer of a full-time job. So he not only mentored me as a, a faculty member, but uh, guided me to Pacifica. And uh, for that, I'll always be uh, tremendously uh, grateful to Robert. But I love the idea of minoring in a discipline, right? And, and then the hope was, if we could, to write a dissertation in which both disciplines were engaged, and not necessarily on equal level, but um, that uh, that interdisciplinary imagination was Louise's. So uh, some of this is um, uh, inspirited. Uh, yeah, that's the right verb uh, by her. She would say to us that to read poetry is to enlarge our sensibilities and to make us aware of the ontology of being. So she was the first faculty member in four degrees that brought up ontology as part of the poetic universe. And it stunned me. And I knew she was right. I just didn't have the language for it. The images in poetry, and this is, this is part of her methodology, if you will, because I think contemplation is a methodology. Uh, contemplation, she would uh, suggest, allows us to re-experience the poem in their fullness so we can apprehend the fullness of its vision. And that was her byline, poetry is about vision. It's not about information. Although we need its particularities to get to that vision. And she said, you know, it might not happen in the first or the fourth or the 14th reading. But if you stay with it and contemplate it again and again, its vision, which is synonymous with its form, will begin to emerge. That's how organic she felt poetry was, nothing mechanistic. It was a, a, a living organism. 
to the degree we are open to it, it will disclose itself. And I've already mentioned that. Um, I think, uh, this is coming off of some of her thinking, that the poetic, uh, that the poetic image has power. It creates that field of being for contemplation. See, if the field is put in place and everyone consents to it without feeling, oh, I can't disagree with anything, you know, we set that aside, then the ability to contemplate deepens. And so she was one of the best readers of poetry and literature that I've ever experienced, both in print and in a classroom setting, uh, is that we don't analyze these works of literature, we contemplate them. And you can hear and feel, I bet, the difference in attitude between analysis and contemplation as one is present uh, to, a, to a poem, which we are going to be in just a couple of minutes and that we are invited in with our own personal mythology. This is my sense, uh, and I think it's shared by many, if not most of you, in order to be informed <clears throat> and in order to be transformed by the image that's in motion. One of Faulkner's uh, tenets about what he wrote he says that, you know, human beings are always in motion, and so is fiction. So to read works of fiction is to resonate with the motion of the, of the work in its plot development that touches deeply the motion that we are constantly in, be it just in thinking or in dreaming or in physical action, and that both have their existence only in the contemplative act. So analysis will take us so far, explication will take us so far, but contemplation will take us deeper than either of them can imagine. And so she said, pose this question when you come on a new poem or a new work of fiction. What is the symbolic climate of the work? And she was always so wonderful in pushing us to ask, what is the atmosphere? When you step into the world of a poem or a, or a tragedy or a comedy, um, what's the atmosphere? What does it smell like? How does it feel viscerally? I'm thinking of Sheila's work. Uh, here, but in also many others of you, because it's an embodied experience in which, she said, his characters live and breathe. To miss this, she claimed, is to miss the depth psychological dimension that is the work. And then this line that I want to share with you that I've hung on to for 40 some years, she asked, what does the poet call us to? And her response is, the poet calls us to a context. In other words, the poet calls us to a world that's formed. And I add to what she said, because I don't think we should leave it out, the poet also calls us to a content. There's a content there that we grapple with. They can't be separated. In reading a work of poetry, there is an interior movement. Its inner psychic action grips us. But again, we have to be open and yield to it. Uh, and, and there were students who had a hard time with the notion of submitting to the work so it can disclose itself. And there was some resistance there. And that, those conversations were rather fascinating. We read poetry then because it offers us an illusion, or 
of reality. But in that illusion, it shows us something about the real via its fictional quality. It's not too far off, and help me out here, wasn't it Picasso in speaking of art that all art is a fiction, it's an illusion, it's an elaboration that takes us to the truth of things <clears throat> better than a historical reality ever could. I think it was Picasso's idea, and that's an idea that's shared um, by us, I imagine, or many of us, so that the form, Louise was the first one in all the literary uh, literature professors I had over the years, graduate and undergraduate, who spoke about organic form as the basis of a poem's existence. And she would, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase her here, but the idea is worth, very much worth sharing with you all. Form begins to emerge, not through reason, not through explanation, but through the imagination. So it's an embodied insight. Here then, the parts of the poem are gathered up. We give up part of ourselves in order to get at it. So a question that we might ask ourselves in all seriousness and in a bit of levity is when you enter this work that you're going to um, begin reading, what are you willing to give up in order for it to disclose itself? Uh, to give up being right, uh, to give up a point of view, uh, to hold it in suspension, at least for a time, <clears throat> for a time. And that opens up the ontology, Louise believed, of the work. And if we don't get at its metaphysical basis, we haven't arrived yet at the work's fullest uh, meaning. In form, all the parts are connected. And it's a visionary form, which is what Robert Penn Warren called it. So we read, we reread, we contemplate, we converse, and slowly <clears throat> the form of the work, what it is in the world to envision, begins to surface. Yeah. And the, the response, I'm speaking for me, but I think I'm connecting with you too, is a real sense of joy in learning. You know, if learning isn't joyful, at least in part, uh, something is dropped out. And uh, the joy in learning is what she uh, infected us, graduate students, with. And to contemplate for its own sake, not for an end uh, beyond itself. Myths and archetypes then are affected by a poem. They shift. They change under the weight of the poets crafting them into new forms. The poet Keats called this approach negative capability, which is an ability to feel and see the work and through the work to our own feelings, which are formed by the experience. Our feelings are reordered and perhaps renewed, something deeply healing is in this process. So I'm going to stop there because um, I want us to have an experience of reading. And so Dana, would you be good enough to bring up Jane Hirschfield's poem? So folks, just read it. And if you're feeling like it, reread it. And I'm going to be silent.
So re if you haven't, reread it a second time. Okay, now I'm going to read it to you. So, not moving even one step. The rain falling too lightly to shape an audible house, an audible tree, blind, soaking, the old horse waits in his pasture. He knows the field for exactly what it is, his limitless mirror his beloved. Even the mallard sleep in her red body, maned in thistles, hooved in the new green shallows of spring. Slow rain streams from fetlocks, hips, the lowered head, while she stands in the place beside him that no one sees. The muzzles almost touch. How silently the heart pivots on its hinge. Now, I'm, I'm less interested in what the poem means and more interested in your comment, your observation on what your experience of reading it is. Um, and if we had more time, we could have done, um, we might have done just a short writing of four or five minutes on what your experience was. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, all of you are reading this for the first time because uh, uh, it very well be, it may be that you've read it uh, on your own before. But then to reread it and to ask you for three or four minutes to write on what in the experience of rereading, uh, did anything shift for you, open up for you? But we'll do it uh, in conversation here. So let me back up and ask you again. <clears throat> what, what is your experience? What was your experience of reading it? And I don't know if we should have it up here for people to refer to. Dana, I'm thinking I maybe can, so. I can go back to it. Would um, you? Yeah, I can go back to it. I wanted okay. to say one thing that uh, really occurred sure. to me. Yep. was the, the synesthetic quality, to use David Abrams' word, where yes. I felt like words were being used to convey, uh, I can smell the rain, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I could feel the hinge of the heart creaking, you know, like a, like a door of a barn. And, yeah. and, I, and I think that the language in there was designed to evoke the physical senses, and and so uh, you know, with that, let me let me put the poem back up there. I I just I, I think it's a beautiful poem. I it just it really does it works. Yes, thank you for your observations there now, too, Dana. We do have Odette. Can I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Sure. And I'm going to bring Odette in. So Dennis, first I wanted to uh, let you know that the very first time I met you at Pacifica before starting, before deciding to go to Pacifica, you talked about reading in this way. 
And I had never heard anybody talk about reading entering into a text in this way. It completely changed my life and my relationship with reading. Wow, thank you for um, that. And, and I think also the way that I ended up teaching um, reading, I was really informed uh, by, by what I learned from you. So thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, um, and also, uh, what happened to me now is, is exactly the same thing. I read the text twice, and then I heard you speak the words, and it is as if you're entering into a dream. You're entering into yes. the texture of a dream. It is it's no different. Um, and yep. the contemplation just, you know, I, know, I remember Walter talking about dream analysis and how you, you take an image and you live with that image. You don't really yes. analyze that image. Right. So that image changes and morphs and it penetrates you. And that's what happens when you read this, when you were reading the text, that's what happened for me. It's just like I was filled with it. I have no idea even what each word might mean individually or how the author meant it, but it just swells <laughs> uh, inside of you. Yes. So that Beautiful. was my experience. Uh, A wonderful verb. Uh, oh, the, the swelling. Yes. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Any from the panelists? I'm sure we all have many things we can say about about this poem. Um, for for me, I, I think it's so interesting the way that uh, you know I've got my analogy that I'm bringing to it because that's the analogy that's very relevant to me in my life right now. Yes. Yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are, you know, in this room, 50 private analogies that the way that these, these poems create something so deeply personal, so deeply important without, you know, doing it in any intentional way really speaks to what you've been talking about all night. You know, the, the way that these poems can bring out something that not only could have never been written uh, because it's a different analogy, but this stuff can be so incredibly personal uh, that we co-create with as, as readers. Yes. So uh, another couple of questions that I had um, written out are, what does the poem make available to you, reader? And maybe saying the same thing in different words, what does it evoke? Because uh, art is evocative. Um, and of course, not just poetry or not the written word, but that evocative quality that it has, I think, um, is what invites analogies to yoke it to. I remember reading Jung's observation about learning, and he said, if you give if you give the psyche something so completely new that it has no way to sink a hook into it, uh, it will remain uh, completely incomprehensible. But if you yoke it to something that the person will probably know then they can absorb the unknown because it is now tethered to something known. And I'm getting a feeling, listening uh, to many of you, that Jung is saying, find an analogy in the world that's familiar and link it to this new idea or image that is so unfamiliar but the psyche can take it in and integrate it because it's coming in with something familiar. I just thought that was a, a genius way of thinking about learning. Please, Kwame. Yeah, uh, just a quote, a quote on that. They say the best way to train a wild elephant is to yoke it to one that has already been through the process. Oh, there it is. The wild one comes to see, though startlingly different, it is still viable. Okay. Say, would say it again, please, because that's rich. Say the best way to train a wild elephant is to yoke it to one that has already been through the process. 
This way, the wild one comes to see, though startlingly different, it is still viable. Okay. Yeah, right on for the quote, but I got a question. Yes. Out of all the poems that you know of, why did you select that one? I, well, first, I, I love Jane Hirschfield, and I love her prose about poetry. I love that she has been a practicing Buddhist for 40 or some odd years, and how that attitude that she has developed seeps into her, um, her poetry. And I don't hear her name. I hear Rumi's name, and this is no critique, just an observation. I hear Rumi's name. I hear Mary Oliver's name. Um, I don't hear Sharon Olds's name very much either. So I thought, you know, I, I'm not hearing Jane Hirschfield, who I think could use some good press. And then, uh, Kwame, it was my moving through the book and as Dana pointed out, and I believe he's correct, that this is on page eight. The title arrested me. And I thought, well, read this. And the title, the title is what yoked me in. And then when I read the contents, I thought this is this is the perfect poem to use tonight. So that's that's what I'm recalling uh, went on. And the other thing about her poetry, it, its language is so familiar and its, its content is so mysterious. And the tension in that, I just, brings me back to her again and again. Yeah. So the evocative quality of poetry, and I'm, I'm not wanting to... Um, uh, step on anybody's toes if you'd like to make any other observation on it. And I know right now you're holding it uh, in memory. You don't have it in front of you. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't interested in explication so much as evocation, how evocative it is, and, it, and how beautifully, in such simple language, she creates an entire world and one of you just mentioned that, may have, might have been Dana, that, um, you know, you, you feel it in, encapsulate you rather than the reverse, that uh, we encapsulate it. I think the other reason, that punchline at the end, how silently the heart pivots on its hinge, was the clincher for me. I thought the heart pivoting on its hinge is... And it brought back the image of Paul D. in Beloved when he has that confrontation with Beloved. And she says, touch me on the inside and call me by my name. And the chapter ends with, and then he suddenly felt his rusty heart pivot open. And I think that image of the heart pivoting on a hinge. Um, and I hadn't thought about what I'm saying right now, until right now, that it might have been evoked um, by that moment in Beloved. Yeah. The rusty, the rusty heart, like it, it creaked open on its hinge or something akin to that. Yeah. Dennis, I was, I was struck by, um, you know, you asked this question of how the poem made us feel. And just seeing the text up on the screen, I was reminded just looking at the spacing and how much open space there is, you know, between yes. lines and stanzas. And I was reminded how much of my life that involves text is really crafted for efficiency emails and, and social media, it's all compressed, you know, it's all, the, the text is all compressed and brought together. And I noticed it, it made me feel when I first saw the poem, even before I read a single line of it, just seeing the open space, it felt like human breath. It yes. felt like 
yeah, inhales and exhales, just in seeing the, the space that she yes. had left there, that there was room to breathe as I consumed yes. this poem. Yes, beautifully, beautifully said, John. The page, I mean, I've got my writing there, but the page is more white space than it is print space. And I wonder if that, your remarks couldn't be part of her Buddhist practice of, you know, leaving space to breathe instead of filling it all in, you know, like a busy day. And then you're lying in bed at 11 p.m. thinking, I'm freaking exhausted. And what did I accomplish today? Really not sure. It's that manic drive. And so your remark about open space, you come to the end of the poem and you can breathe because there's so much white space below it. And that's one of the beauties of poet and see this uh, secretive heart, which is on the other side of the page. Same thing, but look at the white space as margins on both sides of that poem that uh, we didn't look at. Um, yeah, she gets it, that there's, a, there's silence. Um, you know, Sandy and I are part of a group that goes online and has a Zoom every Saturday at four, for an hour. And people that we've known from uh, San Antonio and the University of Incarnate Word. And last Saturday, I wrote the woman who is the mistress of our flock of nine of us. And I wrote and I said, uh, we won't be on today. I just, I just do not want to talk anymore today. And so we'll see you the following Saturday. I, I can't tell you how much, how many years went by before I was able to do that. Usually I would just show up and tough it out. And I thought, I can't keep, so I needed white space Saturday afternoon. And I think Sandy and I watched a movie and we talked little because we both wanted to be silent within, but we were watching an engaging film at the same time. So I think poetry invites the silent part of ourselves. I'm coming off of your uh, keen observation and it's in the silence. I think that the deepest contemplation can take place, not in the reading of the words, but in the, in the uh, afterwash, the afterglow of the words. Um, who was it? Help me out here. The spontane poetry is the spontaneous flow of powerful feelings recollected in moments of tranquility. I'm pulling that up from my undergraduate days that is either Wordsworth or Coleridge. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, but recollected in moments of tranquility, in moments of contemplation. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was Wordsworth that is, uh, that's, that's a mantra, I think, for reading poetry as well as for uh, writing uh, poetry. Dennis, you know, yes, sir. You're, you'd have to be brain dead not to know how beloved you are within this community. So oh, at, the, well, thank at, you. The, at the risk of keeping you here longer than you might otherwise, um, and given that this is the fifth and apparently the final of the series that we're going to be doing, um, Maybe you would be able to rummage around on your desk and find one of your own poems that you would feel like closing this entire series out with that, um, you know, just might put a nice little cap on the whole thing. Uh, there he says, putting you on the spot, but. Okay, you just give me 30 seconds. We'll do that. While Dennis is taking time to do that, can we all just 
take a minute and, and say thank you before he closes us out with the poem? Sure. Okay, because this has been really powerful and I just want to start with my thanks here, Dennis. This is, I hope you're hearing while you're searching. <laughs> he will, but it'll also be on the tape. Okay. I'll, I'll edit it in. <laughs> well, this this was above and beyond, Dennis, and, and we, I, really is heartfelt. We really thank you. No, I, 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 it's just been, thank you for that. And it's been an, it's been an absolute pleasure to be with all of you. And what I said to Sandy the other day about this five classes, I said, I really didn't think I'm made of the stuff to teach online. Um, but through this five sessions, I've really grown kind of fond of it. And it's been a, it's been a terrific, um, it's been a terrific experience for me. Um, and I'm just, I'm just, uh, give me. Oh, I think you got a few more minutes because I know John Kwame and I all want a chance to say the same thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's totally honored, uh, by, you know, your graceful presence and thank you. I, I, you know, I've taken so much from this personal lessons, mythological lessons, creative lessons, teaching lessons, reading lessons, writing lessons. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I, thank you so much. Hey, hey uh, thanks, Dennis, man. Uh, love you, brother. All right. Love, love you, too. I love all of you. Dennis, I just have to say before you read this final poem for us, uh, yes. this has just been such a, a gift that you've given us during this time. And I, I've really been thinking lately a lot about how thankful I am for uh, the, the gifts of this season, in, of this COVID season that have been filled with so many curses. It's so beautiful and wonderful uh, to, for those of, uh, who have offered gifts to us during this time. And you have given us a delightful, meaningful, and memorable gift. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, as I said to, at the beginning, what a joy to be around all of you and, and participants who were at one time my students and who I continue to learn from. I mean, that, I think one of the great joys of um, being a teacher is to learn from one's students or former students. Uh, it's one of the great joys. So I, I can't thank all of you enough and all of you participants for coming um, uh, session after session and contributing. And, and even if you didn't speak up, you were here and you were a witness to it. So this is from a volume uh, called Road, Frame, Window, A Poetics of Seeing. And two other uh, men, Timothy Donahue and Don Carlson. Tim Donahue was my high school student, 1970, 1971 at Lorain Catholic High School. And one time I went over to Tim's house for dinner uh, when he was a senior and his mother took me into the, his bedroom and said, he said, I want to show you something. And on the wall next to Tim's bed was like a rainbow arc of words um, that in the middle of the night, she says at 2 AM, he hears a line of poetry and he has a flashlight and a magic marker. And he turns the flashlight on and he hardly has to do any more than get up on his elbow and he writes the words down. And then in the next morning, he's blown away because he wrote them in a kind of quasi waking, dreaming. And as a poet, he's just remarkable. And Don Carlson was an undergraduate student of mine uh, at the University of Dallas when I uh, taught on the Rome campus. So uh, this was a, a, a treat, like with Craig uh, Deininger, to work with uh, former students in a, in a volume. 
So this is, uh, this is my poem called Page Proofs. Like a dog snuffling at every turn of the page, I hunt one last time for errors conceived in speed, birthed from behind the book's blurbs, and nursed by the careless eyes that refuse to spot you, idle, between corrected prose. You intent on slipping into the final, the one that gallops into the world full of performance. Quote, read me now, I'm all corrected. But the disease of deviant spellings grows down and in. Quote, our sense of social justice rests often, ellipsis, and justice is spelled J-S-T-I-C-E. Like gaps in a clean white row of straightened teeth, the pen appears a scalpel, already red, poised to add the gauze of I and you to make the patient whole. Blood work. Blood work is the proof. Thank you all. This was just a delight, and uh, I love you all. You this know. has been a beautiful experience, and I thank everyone, and thank you especially, Dennis, and John, and Kwame, and Dara, and yeah. my beautiful partner, Will. Yes. Where would, where would we be? This is really... This is incredible. So thank well, you. Dana and, and Will, you've brought so much into the world through uh, hosting me and hosting um, uh, folks at the Miss Salon. And I'm honored to be a, a panelist in that as well. So a lot of riches have come out of both of your collaborations together. And I hope you just keep doing it and doing it. We're having fun. Yep, you're having fun. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. See ya.